thanks very much. So at this point, uh, we get to the first of the several panels uh, during the meeting. This is a panel on the economic and national security implications of fracking. Uh, David, in his introductory talk, gave a, a very good summary, I think, of the economic implications of fracking, uh, which are huge. Uh, as he said, there's, it's creating jobs, it's lowering the price of energy, it's making the U.S. closer to being energy independent, it's increasing the competitiveness of the U.S. economy, and it's having a very positive environmental impact as well, in a number of ways. Um, so there are far-reaching implications uh, in the economic field, and also, as David indicated as well, far-reaching implications to the national security field. Uh, the U.S. is used to thinking of itself as heavily dependent on the Middle East for its energy supplies, or the crucial energy supplies. Um, as we've heard, uh, the U.S.'s dependence on the Middle East is falling rapidly and will be close to zero in the very near future. Uh, it may not be energy independent, but will certainly be independent of the Middle East, um, which I think we'll probably feel very comfortable about. Uh, that obviously has far-reaching national security implications. You know, about a third of the U.S.'s armed forces are currently in the Middle East or someone close to the Middle East, including two carrier battle groups sitting in the Straits of Hormuz right now. Uh, it's costing us billions and billions of dollars a year. And an interesting question is whether we all wish to continue having incurring those costs once we're no longer dependent on the Middle East for our, uh, uh, for our energy sources. Uh, interestingly enough, the main beneficiaries of those carrier fleets at the moment are probably Japan and China rather than the U.S. Japan and China get most of their energy from the Middle East these days. Uh, and so they're becoming dependent on the Middle East just as we're becoming independent of the Middle East. There's an interesting irony, I think, in many ways. Uh, that has a lot of national security implications, a lot of geopolitical implications. We've got a really great panel to discuss these issues. Uh, Dave Fried Freudenthal, who was two-term governor of Wyoming, and has a reputation of having developed a very, very sensitive and a very effective regulatory framework while he was in that position, a framework which uh, rather unusually is also applauded both by the industry and by the environmental groups. It takes quite some political skill to get that, uh, that kind of reputation, I think, Dave. Um, I'll be congratulated on that. We've got Travis Bradford, who's a professor in the School of International Public Affairs, also known as SEPA. Uh, who is an expert on uh, energy and energy and renewable energy in particular. And Jason Bordoff, also from SEPA, director of the Energy Center in SEPA, who joined us recently from President Obama's National Security Council. Uh, so we've got a very interesting group of people here. I'm going to each ask each panelist to talk for 12 or 13 minutes, and that will leave us about half an hour for open discussion. And the discussion, again, the, the format for discussion is please uh, fill out these cards that you've got in front of you, uh, hand them to the gentleman on the left and right, uh, and uh, they'll get them up to me, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of pick and choose and consolidate, and we'll have a discussion based on that. So, Dave, over to you for the first time. Thanks. Am I first? Yes, you're first. You can stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, last. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Where's the further last shall be first? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Ooh, a little gobble here. Um, good morning. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm always very interested. I, I left office in 2011. I'm always very interested to hear people um, talk about sort of the theoretical aspects of regulation. Um, I spent, it's always, um, it's always illuminating uh, to know how I should have done it um, as opposed to how we did it. Um, by way of background, you need to understand that uh, most of what you know about Wyoming is probably the Grand Tetons, Yellowstone, Devil's Tower, if you're old enough to have watched Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, and that it's got a lot of open space and not very many people. And those of us who live there like it that way. Um, so don't plan to move out. Um, you're, you're welcome to stay in New York. Um, what, is, um, what is not generally known about Wyoming is that it is um, essentially the largest energy exporting state in the United States. Um, by virtue of its production, it produces about 12% of the energy consumed in the United States. Um, and if you're governor of Wyoming, you like all of the energy. And, and when you say all of the above, you mean it. You're not like President Obama, who doesn't really mean it. Um, you mean it because you've got coal, oil, gas, wind, um, and uranium. Uh, and you've got them all. And you've got them all in abundance. About 40% of the class 5 to 7 wind is in Wyoming. Um, it gets developed about as fast as you can get power lines sited, uh, which in this country is not very fast. Uh, pretty slow. So you end up with uh, a lot of resource that's on the table but not developed. The other thing that you should probably remember about Wyoming is that it's a very Republican place. Um, it's the state that Dick Cheney claimed to be from so that he could be on the ticket. Uh, it gave you, um, it gave you um, uh, Al Simpson of the Simpson Bowles Commission and uh, our grand contribution to legal thought is a Supreme Court jurist known as um, Van Devander, 
who uh, hated everything FDR and was one of the four horsemen who went out of his way to oppose uh, labor laws related to women and children. Uh, but other than that, we're a fairly progressive place. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that the, the dominant uh, views in Wyoming um, are really very much uh, focused on the outdoors, on the resources, and the opportunities that people have to live there. You live there by choice. It's not a place that uh, you either like it or you leave it. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of those places that the fundamental fabric, I mean, what people do on the weekend and do on their vacations is they go outside. Uh, when, um, when you see a picture of, uh, uh, you know, of, a, of a beautiful place, most people think, well, that's nice because they drive by it in their car. People in Wyoming think that's nice because I'm going to go up there and hike. Uh, I'm going to get out. So they're very much active users of the outdoors. So when you talk about energy development in Wyoming, the balance is, is it needs to be regulated. And the public generally supports that. Um, Wyoming is, is sort of a, a uh, has a dichotomy. Out of the last 40 years, 28 years of those the governors have been Democrats, of which I was one. Uh, and in fact, um, on most state issues, it's uh, relatively positive if you talk about um, uh, preserving the values of uh, the environment, not in the context of uh, kind of the nuts and granola crowd that you find in Jackson Hole, but in the, but in the, but in the context of people who uh, recreate, hunt, fish, get out, and, and actually participate. It turns out that it's a, a fairly uh, important issue. It's also a public land state. 47% uh, of the surface is owned by the federal government, 80% of the minerals, and uh, that places um, the governor of the state dealing with the federal government. Um, they think uh, they're kind of co-governor, um, a dispute that we've always had. Uh, fortunately, uh, New Mexico versus CLEPI actually established that state law can apply to federal uh, lands in the absence of direct preemption, and so we do that fairly vigorously. Um, the state has a long history of oil and gas development. It is culturally comfortable with it. It is something that it's adapted to, and it is something that it has vigorously regulated in various forms since the 1950s. 1950s saw the advent of the Oil and Gas Commissions, which were primarily focused on correlative rights and waste, concept not applicable to this discussion, but it's how it sort of originates. Uh, has a lot of the same technical questions uh, with regard to the movement of underground materials and the uh, uh, development of oil and gas that also permeates the question of hydraulic fracking. Oil and Gas Commission is supplemented by um, uh, the state's function through its own police powers with regard to environmental protection, but also its function as um, under cooperative federalism, which is a bit of a joke, but at least under those uh, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and some of the o other programs that the state enforces on behalf of the federal government, uh, it has very broad uh, authority, both uh, under its own police power authority and also under the authority that it exercises on behalf of the federal government. Um, the reason that that gets to be important, and I learned this during my eight years as U.S. Attorney, is, is that the role of the federal government, in particular in Clean Water and the Safe Drinking Water Act, is very real. And when they want to uh, enforce that, uh, if the state fails to enforce it, EPA through Region 8 will enforce it on private land. So you find that the state is equally vigorous on uh, private and public lands in terms of the enforcement. We adopted a program for regulation of hydraulic fracking for two reasons. Um, one is that the technology had evolved past what we had on the books for the Oil and Gas Commission. That is to say that the, the technology, in terms of the amount of pressure that can be applied underground, has just gone up exponentially. And the amount and the, and the number of fracks has gone up exponentially. So what we needed was a new set of regulations. And we were the first state to adopt them, and we adopted them in part because we needed to catch up with technology and in part because you needed to give the public confidence that somebody was looking after this issue. Because I think one of the key factors that's allowed this debate to get out of hand is, is that the regulators haven't really said how they're going to manage it. In our case, what we did is we concentrated on wellbore integrity, which was talked about a little bit, but it's really the fundamental question, is whether or not you have the capacity to contain the materials at the pressure that it's placed in the ground. So we uh, updated everything with regard to uh, the amount of concrete, the amount of weight, the amount of uh, 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 casing that you have to use. And if you look at it, it's a fairly strict regimen. The other thing we did is disclosure. Disclosure was relatively easy uh, once we got it sort of figured out, which is you got to disclose everything to the state, including the formula. Uh, so the only portion, though, that is actually put out on the website are the contents, right? So that the formulaic part is actually protected as a trade secret. 
and that's being litigated, and, and right now the state district court has ruled in favor of those rules from the commission that, in fact, you have the right. The reason that we wanted all the material is for public health and safety. In the event, because one of the concerns you have if you live there is that you're going to have an accident, because inevitably, I mean, accidents happen. You're going to have an accident on a rig, and somebody is going to get exposed. You need, to, not only for their safety, but also for the safety of the people in the emergency room, to have more information available than what is in, in an MSDS sheet. That's not enough. And so we made, set up a system where they can get access to the full range of materials if they need it, and they can make it work. The other thing is um, we concentrated on how you handle the water. Right? In our particular formations, you get back about 80% of the water from a frac. Now, one of the things that people don't distinguish is between the frac fluid and produced water. Right? The frac fluid is the stuff that comes back up uh, that has been placed in there along with the water and whatever else. In parts of Wyoming, you actually get back more liquid than you put in. Right? In other parts of Wyoming, you get back about 80% of it. Right? And then after that, and you're into production, you have what's called produced water. And that water can really vary in quality. Some of it is, is uh, good enough water that in an arid place like Wyoming, uh, they actually file for water rights on it so the rancher can use it. And that's produced water, but that's not always the case, but in some cases it is. And we have a provision to do that. But what happens is, with regard to the flowback, there are a couple of things that we require. Uh, one is, obviously, they, ha they have to manage it. Most people try to recycle it. To the extent they can't recycle it, the portions that can't be recycled end up being put into an injection well properly permitted um, uh, injection well so that you know where it's going to go, you know what formation it's going to go into, you got a fairly reliable system. Now, the Oil and Gas Commission, in order to protect itself against the bad actor, we have what's called the Orphaned Well Fund. Right? It's a one mil or two mils, depending on, on how, how, how badly it's getting hit, fund by which you essentially socialize the cost in the event uh, among the industry in the event that you have an operator who does well and who is essentially um, not credit worthy to begin with, their bond doesn't cover the cost of rehabilitation. So in effect, this orphan well fund steps in and does what the operator should have done in terms of protecting the environment, doing the cleanup and the rest of it. So in effect, you've socialized the cost of the bad actor. Right? The other thing that does is it encourages the rest of the industry to pound on the bad actor a lot because they really don't like paying for their problems uh, through the Orphan Wealth Fund. Right? So those protections um, have now been expanded to include the cost of fracking, which means that that mill levy goes up because the scale of things is just so much bigger. Right? It's not that it's different, it's just bigger. Right? And it's got more pressure behind it, it's got more contents in it, and it seems to work. Now, the, with regard to the air quality questions, um, we did what's called green completions which required them to um, uh, capture, the, particularly in the early stages, capture the material that came back. And it was initiated by some of the industry, and then we uh, compelled it on the rest of the industry. Because if you do a green completion, some of the real concerns about, about flaring uh, go away, because you've captured the worst of the chemicals, uh, and you're not flaring them. You're not burning them. All right? Now, you're going to have some post-completion uh, flaring depending on how far you are from the production site. I mean, it just sort of, sort of happens. But the key is, is on the front end, there are ways to do it. The way we set ours up is, is that companies are obligated to do green completion unless it's a true wildcat. That is, they're out in the middle of nowhere where there's just nothing there. Then if they're clear out in the middle of nowhere, they'll get a, get a little relief on the, uh, on the green completion question. The, the question of water availability, uh, Wyoming's one of those arid uh, mountain states. Uh, that uh, collectively referred to as a high plains desert, or under the census classification, it's referred to as frontier. So there's water shortage, right? But water's regulated in our state by somebody called the state engineer, because ours was a prior appropriation state, very different than what you deal with in the east. Right? So what happens there is rancher's got his water, and he's not doing real well ranching. So what he does is he'll convert his water right on a temporary basis and sell it to the oil and gas company or the service company who's doing the fracking. And he'll actually make more money selling it to them for a couple of years than he will in agriculture just because of the, the price. I mean, it, you know, it's a way to do it. But it's regulated, right? It's regulated by the state engineer. The key on all of this is to have a regulatory strategy. I, I made the mistake last night of saying I didn't like their best management practices because I don't. I mean, I, I, we can talk about that another day. I think that if you actually have to do it, what you begin to realize is best management practices is theoretical. 
what you really have to have is a fairly severe set of rules that force people to comply, but they have to be based on result, not based on the practice. Because you can't say that if they did everything the rules required, then they're off the hook. Because you're not sure that you know what everything in the rules is. The last part that we did, and then I'll sit down because I want you guys to have lots of time. Uh, the last thing we did is on disclosure. Uh, we made sure that um, to the extent the information is gotten by the state, we hold on to it. So that if 10 years from now, you end up with a migration event that you need to try to figure out how did something get there, you at least have some idea of what, in the, what went in the wells and the formations around there. Because part of the problem is, is this causation question is, is really difficult. It is really difficult. Uh, and if you've done any oil and gas law or if you've grown up in an oil and gas place, you know that trying to predict what's really going on underground is difficult. It's easier today because uh, the micro seismic uh, techniques and some of the stuff they've done are just amazing in terms of their capacity to tell. The other thing to remember about hydraulic fracking is the company has no interest, and this is one of the things that we rely on at the Oil and Gas Commission, because they have to submit their material to us. We approve it prior to the frack, right? And what are you approving? Well, you're approving their design, and you're saying that design is only good to so much pressure. If they exceed that pressure, then they got problems, right? Then they get on the site, and it may or may not go exactly the way they planned. So if it goes different, uh, they have to come back uh, post frack and actually identify everything that they did so that you've got a record and you know what happened. But they can't violate the pressure, right? The other thing I would say is that when you, when you think about the regulatory regime, I'm a big believer, obviously, that the states do it because actually the states know what goes on in their own place. And if you go to EPA or you go to the Bureau of Land Management, there's nobody there who even knows how to read a mechanical integrity test or cement bond log. The states, particularly oil and gas states, have that expertise and have developed over the years. So when I make jokes about so-called cooperative federalism, um, I do that from the perspective when I was U.S. attorney to discover how little respect the feds actually have for the states, and then when I was governor, how angry I got when they proved that. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, So what I, what I would say is that, is that this, is not, this is not some sort of alchemy. This is really pr pretty straightforward stuff. There's a lot more known about it than people want to admit. There's a lot more understood about it than people want to admit. The question is just regulating it. Because remember, if you, if you think about the economic activity, it's a lot more fun to be governor of a state where people have jobs. And, it's, and the other thing that happens is you need to tax this. And then I'll get off the stage. You need to tax the, the oil and gas development, right? What have we done with the revenues we've received? We create a wildlife trust fund so we can create wildlife habitat. We do that both out of the tax revenues, but we also, as uh, Chuck Stanley will tell you later, we might have blackmailed the industry into some money uh, to help preserve wildlife habitat because it's a core of the state, and you've got to figure out what your values are, and then you use that to supplement it. We fund our education. Uh, you know, we, we uh, rebuild schools. We rebuild buildings at the university. Uh, we've created a scholarship fund that essentially supports any high school graduate in Wyoming who wants to go to either the University of Wyoming or the community colleges. So there are ways to take that revenue, but you've got to be willing to raise it, which means you've got to have the political leadership to say, okay, we want you to make money, but we're going to make some money too so we can serve the interests of the citizens. You can fund the core values of the state. In a place like Wyoming, it has to do with the outdoors, has to do with education, has to do with, frankly, keeping everybody else's taxes low. One of the ways to keep everybody else's taxes low in Wyoming, we have limited sales tax, no corporate income tax, no personal income tax, and 60% of the revenue comes from the middle industry. So um, if you regulate it right and you tax it, it can be a net benefit for the citizens of the state. If you don't do both of those, then I can understand why the public's a little up in arms. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. That was truly insightful and really fascinating. Now, Travis, you're short. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thank you, Governor. Thanks a lot. The, um, I, I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago that was partly sponsored by the Buckminster Fuller Institute. And after a 20-minute uh, power PowerPoint uh, uh, slide description of all of the achievements of Buckminster Fuller, I was expected to get up and say something interesting. Um, I decided I never wanted to follow Buckminster Fuller again uh, on a panel, and I've now decided I also never want to follow Governor Freudenthal <laughs> on a panel. 
Um, the, um, I, I also, Governor, in the defense of the nuts and granola crowd, Chardonnay is a form of recreation. Um, the, um, so, um, um, so, so use some of your state funds for that. So my, um, my, 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 my role here is to actually try to talk about some of the economics of natural gas and, and the, the impact of fracking. I think the, the session, uh, uh, the official title is The Economic Implications of Fracking. Um, I also want to think about, you know, sort of fracking's role in determining um, 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 economic uh, uh, development and some of the economic conditions within the fracking industry because I think that you know, we, a lot of this has gotten very interesting, partly because there have been technical, technical innovations that have been combined to create a new sort of technical platform, and it's opened up a lot of additional volume of, of production, but volume is not economics. Volume is half of the economic equation, and price is the other half, and we, we need to talk about this. So, and volumes, so I want to talk really just for a few minutes about the foundations of natural gas economics and how, and how fracking is playing into this. Because I think there's some uh, misconceptions in the general public, and I think the experts uh, uh, are probably better aligned on this, but, uh, uh, and we can, we can talk more about it uh, uh, when we get to the questions, but I think that the general public sort of believes that we have entered an era when, uh, the, the term that's often used, and I, I, it probably goes back to Dan Jurgen or, or someone like that, um, uh, uh, who has spent some time talking about these issues, but we're, we're, the fracking has created an era of energy abundance. Abundance, of course, is a volume concept, again, not a price concept. And so the, part of the reason that it, 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 it came about, and I was asked a question um, uh, the other night, sort of why did it happen? And, and it really happened because prices had risen from the early aughts and, and before from well below $4 per million BTU to uh, well above 5 or 6 and the expectation with the import, with the new importation of LNG uh, the, and, and, and all of the controversy surrounding citing um, import LNG terminals, my goodness, how quaint is that now, um, the, uh, that, uh, uh, that, we would, uh, need, that we would be in a permanent era of higher gas prices, and that actually created the investment environment and the certainty required to make the, the types of investments in the combinations of technologies that we now kind of think of as the, the package of hydraulic fracturing. And it started off some technical innovation. Uh, more volume breeds technical innovation, which helps, which helps bring down costs and helps you find new places and optimize. And all of that's been good. But remember that it only happened because we had an expectation of substantially higher prices permanently. Um, my, again, how times change very quickly. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the supply and demand of natural gas. On the supply side, uh, conventional natural gas in the United States is falling. It has been falling for a while. It is expected to continue to fall. Uh, the, um, it is, we are not doing a lot more of it. it we are not, we're, we're not looking for a lot more of it. We're still getting some associated gas with oil drilling, but we're not going after new gas wells because, frankly, those are just have just uh, uh, been, uh, been, been determined to be not the first best solution versus some of the fracking place that are available, wide, wide, wide volumes of fracking plays that are available. Um, turns out, though, uh, uh, a number of the fracking plays have also, uh, uh, have also sort of um, hit their stride and in some cases are actually declining, and only a few of the major fields in North America are, 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 are still on the ascendant. Uh, uh, the Marcell Marcellus and the Utica and I think the Eagle Forder uh, are, are the only ones that are still sort of meaningfully growing, and, then, and, and there are others that... Um, a, a lot of others that have peaked, and particularly when you start thinking about the rig counts um, that have also fallen precipitously over the last few years, uh, there's, there, there is a, a leveling off, and, and the EIA has great data on this. I, I spend, I'm, I'm, I'm actually ashamed to admit how much time I actually spend on the EIA site uh, uh, daily, but, uh, uh, but uh, let's just say I, I look at all of the different volume and, and price implications across a wide range of industries to figure out exactly where we are. And, and, and uh, gas from, from frac uh, hydraulic fracturing across the United States uh, is, um, has leveled off in, um, uh, uh, for a while. The, um, uh, obviously, oil's continuing, prices are high, and rig counts are still pretty good. But um, on, the, um, on the demand side, we've actually seen a substantial increase in demand from fuel switching from coal to natural gas. And uh, there, there were some easy pickups in that. There was some excess capacity in the power generation for the gas. Uh, there were some coal-fired power plants that fell kind of below the margin. And, um, uh, and natural gas actually became a better alternative. So demand has gone up. Uh, supply's gone up. 
but is leveling off. Demand has gone up. It's not clear that it's leveling off. Um, and, and certainly, this is all before we ever get to any meaningful or, or, or robust economic recovery in the U.S. economy. So what happened to, and, and we're talking about exports, but that's actually going to take a while to filter through to prices. But if, if we do, in fact, turn our L import LNG terminals to export terminals, we'll, we will see additional demand there that will continue to push prices up. So what's happened? Let's talk about prices. Today, the price for natural gas on the spot market is $4.23. Oh, sorry, that was the Monday price. Um, the May delivery contract, which is coming up faster than I expected uh, is $4.38 and the January 2014, so end of the year, uh, just after the first of the year contract is at $4.70 per million BTU, which is above the 10-year average price for natural gas, above the 10-year price for natural gas. Um, the, um, it means that we, have, uh, we, we are no longer below the average price of natural gas that we've procured over low price environments and high price environments, but we are um, we are getting, we are inching back up. Where was that price, where was the spot price last year at this time? $1.88. It is now $4.23. That's meaningful. We have not yet really sort of come to grips with the fact that gas isn't really nearly as cheap as we thought it was. And if we really want to do much more of this, the price is probably going to have to rise. And there are a lot of estimates about what the clearing price of this is going to be. Um, I think uh, there's, you can find a, a thick part of the estimation um, um, uh, distribution in the $5.50 to $6 range, although that has been creeping up a little bit. Um, um, some people will suggest that technology will do a better job of bringing costs down. I suggest that if depletion rates on wells, which we really don't have a good idea on over the long term, since we haven't really been doing a lot of this in the exact geology that we're do currently doing it, um, that, the, uh, that the depletion rates are subject to a wide error band. And if we are off by a little bit in the wrong direction, you could actually see prices go up substantially higher than the $6 range, probably up into the eights, nines, or even to the double digit range in order to clear supply and demand. So that's just an economic sort of characterization. Maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. All forecasts are wrong, um, although I tend to get really cautious. So the French have a, have a wonderful adage about uh, making money in the property market, which is from the 18th century, which says, um, sell when you hear the sound of trumpets. And, I, um, and so I, uh, I've heard a lot of trumpets lately, and I get a little bit concerned. Um, the, um, but, but what does it matter, sort of what does it matter, right? If you, um, if, if so what, right? Maybe it is expensive, but for lots of things, it's still worth it. Right? Maybe it is still the best thing for us to do, better than not doing it. Right? That's, our, that's our alternative, to not do it. And we wouldn't have the jobs created in Wyoming or Pennsylvania or Texas. We wouldn't have, uh, I think Jason will talk a lot about the energy security implications if, uh, if I know him well. Um, the, um, I, I, we wouldn't have all of those things if we didn't do it. So it may still be worth it. But why does this matter? It matters to the question of how do we regulate it? How do we, how do we deal with it? And, you know, Tom, you brought up a, a really interesting point about how some of the strategies that we might choose to use if we felt that um, bankruptcies or insolvencies were going to be the order of the day at some period over the lifetime of potential damage. That's actually important. If, if you believe that prices are going up, which means margins will get squeezed, then I think we should evaluate those strategies um, a lot more seriously because of the likelihood of the occurrence worth thinking about. Um, I also think that, um, um, you know, that there are a number of other risks that we may want to think about. And I broadly uh, classify these as, as, I have a new term, and it's called Fukushima risks. And Fukushima risks are, I used to sort of talk about them in some abstract, analytical, um, um, not real way, like tail risks or low probability, high cost outcomes. Uh, the, and, and, and there are many of these in, in the world that we look at, um, and, and we even insure for many of these. I have, a, I have a life insurance policy, for instance, which I hope is a very low probability event that I'm going to have to t take advantage of that. Um, the, um, but, but, my, but, but I think that, that there are a number of these that we just need to be cognizant of because there, there may not be enough money to correct for some of these. And, and they're just things that we want to think about. On the, on the, on, and, and they may have as much to do with the economic risk as, as, the, um, uh, as, as, the, as the physical risk that, that, that occurs. But my, 
I think that these sort of include things like water contamination. What happens if, in fact, we do tracer chemicals and the tracer chemicals show up in an, in an aquifer for a meaningful urban population? What kind of reaction will we get? Do you think we'll just maybe shut down all the wells within a mile or two of that? Or do you think that we're going to put on watch every single fracking well in the country because it changes how we think about the possibility or the probability of this event? The, um, what about uh, the, the, the notion of seismic? And in fact, um, I, just, just as a point of reference, I'm not a seismologist by any remote, I, I can barely pronounce it, but, the, um, I, um, but the, 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 there are s uh, some recent reports of seismic, se se seismic activity from um, hydraulic fracturing related activity in the Netherlands, for instance. And, uh, and which actually resulted in, you know, low magnitude earthquakes, but noticeable on the surface and did create actual physical damage. And those are expected to increase if you believe some of the uh, uh, r reports about it. Um, again, I don't know, but what happens if we do? Do you think we'll just stop fracking near those seismic activities? Or will it actually call into question the entire industry? Um, and, in, and the last one I think that's really important is this notion that, that uh, David, you talked about a lot of, is the methane um, uh, value uh, or, or the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the heat forcing values of, of, of methane in the atmosphere. And the new IPCC report's actually going to gross these up a little bit, but the instantaneous forcing is well over, well over 100 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. You don't have to lose much methane for a, something that's 100 times more potent, a greenhouse gas, and, and gas is only 50% uh, a greenhouse, uh, as greenhouse emitting as coal, you don't have to lose very much methane for this to actually become a, 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 what is considered in a full life cycle analysis dirtier than coal. So what happens if that occurs? What happens if there's even a, 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 a credible argument to that effect? You think, in, or what happens if there's a price and it gets put in um, and it will change the economic dynamics? I think what it speaks is to is that the, 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 the opportunity that this industry has created for us, and it is in fact an opportunity, not a guaranteed success, but it is still new and it, it has wide error bands around a lot of these variables, and we should treat it as such when trying to determine how we're going to regulate it going forward. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much uh, for uh, having me here. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, the, the Resources for the Future did a survey recently of expert views on uh, unconventional uh, gas production, and it was actually really useful, I think, what they did, because they went to industry experts, they went to environmental experts, and they found a broad consensus. I mean, there's a lot of shouting and a lot of yelling about this issue on both sides. But in terms of what we should really be worried about and where the real risks are, there was broad consensus across the board uh, from Republicans and Democrats, industry and environmentalists, about uh, where we were headed with unconventional development and what the risks were. And I agree with almost everything that you heard uh, this morning uh, from the dean and, and from the governor about where, to, where the real risks are, where, where we need to be focusing, and where the opportunities are. Um, so I will say uh, just a word about that. This, um, this is not mine, so should I just start pressing forward? Oh, there we go. Um, so, uh, you know, D Dean Schizer really actually talked, quite, uh, talked through uh, many of the economic and national security implications of what we're seeing happening in the unconventional oil and gas space. Uh, and so I'll provide a couple of pictures to sort of put them in context, but you heard some of the numbers already. And it really is extraordinary. Uh, I mean, it, it is. And, and there are error bands, and there's uncertainty about where we're headed, as, uh, as Travis said. But the extent to which <clears throat> the North American energy landscape has changed in the last five years from an outlook of scarcity to one of abundance, and I, I do think that's an accurate word to use, uh, is really quite extraordinary, particularly in the energy space, given the the magnitude of the scale of the resources required to power the global economy, things don't change quickly in the space, right? It's a big ship and it turns really slowly. And for something to 
turn around this quickly um, is really quite uh, extraordinary. So <clears throat> this is just a visual picture of how the world has changed. This is the annual energy outlook from 2005, and then the most recent annual energy outlook, showing <clears throat> projections for U.S. natural gas imports. Uh, as you can see, just a handful of years ago, we were projected to incre import ever-increasing amounts of natural gas. The red is liquefied natural gas which is much more costly than traditional conventional natural gas or unconventional gas. Uh, and so we were projected to in import increasing amounts of costly natural gas. And now that's gone. Uh, we have completely eliminated that need, and we will soon be a net exporter of, uh, of natural gas uh, by pipeline and uh, potentially, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, potentially by... Uh, by ship as well. And there was a question that the prior, that the prior speakers got about exports, and, and I'm, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> this, and, and again, I understand Travis sort of saying there's uncertainty, and we don't know what the outlook is. I would just say that every additional piece of information we get surprises to the upside and exceeds what everybody thought would be the case six months or a year ago. So the potential gas committee at the University of Colorado School of Mines every two years <clears throat> does a projection, uh, does an estimate of the, uh, of the gas resource base in North America. They just put out their most recent estimate two years after the prior one. It's 26% higher. Uh, the production levels continue uh, to outpace uh, what we thought they would be. Uh, gas is over $4 today. It was $2 a year ago, but nobody thought it would stay at $2. It's also a little bit higher today because we had an unexpectedly cold snap uh, in the spring. Uh, and, you know, I think if gas stays at, like, four, five, even six, and we'll see what the prices are in a minute in Europe and Asia, that's still pretty cheap gas. Uh, and that has a huge opportunity uh, for the U.S. economy. This is the uh, oil outlook. So again, I took the annual energy outlook from 2005 and the annual energy outlook from uh, the most recent one, 2013. And you can see <clears throat> in 2025, the amount of oil that we are projected to import uh, is now 12 million barrels a day lower than people thought it would be in 2005. Um, we consume 18 and a half a day. I mean, that's a staggering figure, right? That is, that is an, a, a really staggering transformation. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, it's important to note that this is about unconventional uh, tight oil production. It's also about consumption and demand. And part of the reason that we can talk about national security benefits and reduced uh, oil import dependence is because oil demand is turning around and going down uh, as a result of fuel economy standards, uh, also as a result of low price of natural gas. I think we... I'm sort of skeptical we'll see natural gas penetrate into passenger vehicles. I do think there is a real opportunity, just driven by the economics and potentially by regulation, for natural gas to uh, displace crude oil, to displace petroleum in heavy-duty trucks, in rail, in marine transportation. And if we replace 30 percent of the truck fleet with uh, LNG, uh, that's 600,000 barrels a day of diesel consumption in the U.S., we consume in the Northeast 600,000 barrels a day of uh, oil for heating. And you're seeing increasing, I mean, there are challenges bringing pipelines into this area, but increasingly you're seeing pipeline development built out of the Marcellus to take advantage of the cheap gas there. And, we're gonna inc and, and those levels are going down, and they're going to keep going uh, down. U.S. oil production is up uh, a million barrels a day year on year, two million barrels a day over the last two years. Um, <clears throat> we don't know where it's headed. It's going to, the growth rate, uh, is certainly going to slow, um, but the, 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 every additional piece of information we get suggests reason to be optimistic about what those numbers uh, will look like. And as you heard, the IEA projects that we'll be the largest producer in the world by 2017 or 2020, that North America will be a net uh, oil exporter uh, by 20. 25 or 2030, I think. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's good reason to think that the numbers from the EIA and the IEA are probably a bit too conservative. They get revised upward every year, and they are much more conservative than many of the private sector forecasts that are out there. Uh, and those folks track this stuff pretty closely, too. It's also important to remember that this is not just about uh, North America, uh, but this is shale rock, right? There is source rock everywhere in the world. <laughs> Argentina has the largest natural gas reserves uh, in the world. Uh, we know that China has significant uh, shale resources and Eastern Europe and other places, and there are challenges in all those places. I don't think this revolution would have happened anywhere else uh, the way it happened here for a variety of reasons, uh, but this technology will be brought uh, to other places. And beyond hydraulic fracturing, 
when people talk about the unconventional boom, uh, that's other technology as well. That's oil sands, that's ultra deep water uh, activity like the pre-salt in Brazil. And uh, there is a lot of resource potential around the world. And you know, so for natural gas, we want to talk about North American production because that's where prices get set. But for oil, you want to talk about the global market because for oil, that's where the price gets set. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of shows uh, that this is a North American story too, not just a US story. And you can see uh, U.S. production going up. EIA thinks U.S. production peaks and then starts to decline. Uh, I think it's probably going to keep going up maybe a little bit further. Uh, and then Canadian production uh, has been uh, increasing rapidly and will continue to. Mexico actually has the potential. They've seen declining production, and I think they have the potential to turn that around too. They need some constitutional reforms uh, to get there. Um, so let me turn for a minute to sort of the economic implications and the national security implications of all of this. And you heard uh, Dean Schizer talk about uh, the economic implications, that the price of natural gas uh, in the U.S., uh, in, in North America, in Europe, and in the Pacific Rim is, has typically been pretty closely linked, and that's fallen apart, right? The, price, uh, the pricing of natural gas has completely uh, uh, diverged uh, as a result of the unconventional revolution uh, in North America. And so in Asia, as you heard, it's about 15, 16, 17 dollars a, a, a million BTU. Uh, in the US, it was two, now it's at four. Uh, in Europe, it's in between, it's around nine or 10. And you've started to see that's sort of the geopolitical implication, which I'll come to in a minute. That is um, <clears throat> in part because we've seen all the gutter built up huge capacity to ship us all that natural gas that they thought we were going to need because of the show slide I showed earlier. Well, now we don't need it anymore. And all these supplies of LNG are flowing into Europe. They're creating significant competition for gas within the European market and giving European customers uh, leverage to push back on countries, particularly Russia, that have typically had a monopoly hold on, uh, on Europe. And so that uh, competition is driving down uh, the price of natural gas there, and I suspect that will continue. This creates huge economic opportunities for uh, the US. Uh, obviously, we have a competitive advantage, which is why we've seen billions of dollars in manufacturing reinvestment uh, come to the US, huge uh, ethylene crackers and other uh, investments happening. Increased production creates economic activities, obviously, just through the production itself. We've seen a new steel plant being built in Youngstown, Ohio, to build fracking pipes uh, pipe, pipe for, for development that people need. Uh, I mean, we shouldn't overstate these. I think sometimes they are overstated. It is a fairly small segment of the manufacturing sector that is very energy intensive. Uh, but for those, it is a uh, significant uh, opportunity. <clears throat> so let me use my final time to talk a little bit about the geopolitical implications. Um, <clears throat> I already mentioned Europe and Russia and sort of the leverage there. Uh, <clears throat> this sort of shows the way the crude trade map is being redrawn because of North American production. Much more trade within the Western Hemisphere <clears throat> and much less trade east-west. You're seeing increasing flows of Middle East oil not coming to North America but going to Asia. Uh, we've largely eliminated the need to bring African uh, uh, crude into the Gulf Coast and the amount coming into the East Coast is declining rapidly. And this is going to raise questions about um, the sort of understanding we have about burden sharing in the Middle East. So if we do need to keep the Strait of Hormuz open, if we do need to maintain global stability and global energy markets, China is building up a strategic oil reserve of 200 million barrels a day. How do we think about <coughs> sharing the burden of responsibility uh, for maintaining stability there? We can't disengage. Prices are set in the global market. Even if we don't import Middle East crude, we're still going to need to maintain that supply. Um, <clears throat> not to mention the fact that about a million barrels a day of refining capacity in the Gulf Coast is actually owned in part by Saudi Aramco, and they may want to make sure that they continue to have a role in the North American market, I suspect. And then I think this has implications for the future ability of OPEC to hold together as a cartel. They're going to see downward pressure on prices globally. They're going to, the only country with any spare ability to produce is uh, Saudi Arabia. Iraqi production is going up very sharply, uh, and they're going to need to figure out, you know, to what extent they can coordinate and cooperate if they want to maintain production levels that support a certain price. Saudi Arabia needs about $100 a barrel to sort of meet their revenue projections for their budget. 
And the last national security implication I'd sort of mention, we have put much more pain on Iran through our sanctions regime than anyone thought we would a few years ago. And that is largely because, I mean, we've actually succeeded in pulling a million, a million and a half barrels a day of oil off the global market. The goal is to impose pain on Iran without imposing pain on ourselves by driving up the global price of energy. And the fact that U.S. production is up two million barrels a day over the last two years has helped to, disp uh, has helped to offset what we've pulled off the market uh, from Iran. And then uh, <clears throat> these are, I won't go through all of these. We can talk about these uh, in the discussion. Uh, and obviously, we heard a little bit about the environmental uh, implications, the fact that U.S. carbon emissions are down about 12 percent since 2005, although that's turning around a little bit now because natural gas prices are coming up. Uh, <clears throat> but if we have the ability to increase global gas trade and competition and c drive the kind of delinking of gas prices away from oil and bring down the price of natural gas in the Pacific Rim, the way you've started to see happen in North America, in Europe, and has happened in North America, 99% of the net increase in coal consumption, from the, according to the IEA, comes from China and India. And if we can drive economic transition from coal to gas there, the way we've seen in North America, the potential greenhouse gas benefits are very significant. Uh, there are risks, and I'm not getting into those because that's not the topic of this panel. That's the next one, so I don't want to downplay them or say they're not there. They are real. I think they can be managed, as you heard, uh, but, but they are real. I don't want to dismiss them. Uh, but I was just focusing in the time I had on sort of the economic and national security uh, implications. So I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, already have a great collection of questions down here, enough to keep us going for at least another hour, which of course we won't be. <laughs> We've got another 15 minutes, roughly speaking. Uh, let me start off with a really challenging question here. Um, is there such a thing as energy independence when energy markets, especially oil, are decidedly international? Would the United States realistically isolate our protect, protect petroleum resources and keep them for our own use? Uh, Jason, you want to kick off on that one? Um, it's a good question. I think there's a lot of rhetoric around energy independence, and it's helpful to actually describe what that means and what it doesn't mean. As I said in my remarks, it doesn't mean you disengage from the world. Uh, we have uh, global prices for oil are set in the, in the global market, and we uh, need to, we're going to need to be part of those no matter what. Um, it do, it also, but, but there are benefits. I mean, it is true that reducing our import reliance has uh, benefits. It has uh, economic benefits because of increased uh, production. It has benefits on our trade imbalance. Uh, I think the ad you can. I think the adverse impact. Uh, Jeff can tell me if he disagree agrees with this. Uh, the adverse impact of an oil price shock is probably smaller if we have lower import dependence because more of the of that increased spending stays within the U.S. Uh, economy. Um, and I do think it does sort of force a fundamental rethinking about our. Uh, strategic relationships with Middle East producers and with Asia, given that that's where all the demand growth uh, is coming from, about how we share, how we share the balance, as I said, the sort of burden for maintaining that stability uh, and how we engage in a conversation. One of the important things that I think we're going to need to figure out over the next couple of years is how to modernize and rethink the International Energy Agency, which is a group of OECD countries that get together and talk about how to use their, they have a strategic sharing agreement for strategic oil stocks, uh, and that was created in the 1970s in response to the Arab oil embargo when OECD con consumed three quarters of the world's energy. It's now half and it's going down to one third. And so it's not the right group of countries anymore to have a conversation about how to maintain global oil market stability and, 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 and have a conversation about responding to disruptions. And that's going to need to kind of change and, and the membership may need to change uh, moving forward. So energy independence is a term that probably is not super helpful, uh, but you know, increased energy self-sufficiency is real and, is, and, and actually does have meaningful impacts. Yeah. Could you pick up one point you made there, Jason. The uh, IMF recently published a study in which they looked at the following fact. Back in the 1970s, oil prices went from $3 a barrel to $36 a barrel in a couple of years and uh, moved the world economy into recession, to a very serious recession in the 1970s and 80s. Um, recently, well not that, in the last few years, oil prices went from $10 a barrel to $130, $140 a barrel, but there was no equivalent global recession. And the IMF was asking the question, why was the world economy so much more robust against an increase in oil prices this century than 25, 30 years ago. And the answer they came up with was most industrial countries are actually using oil much, much more efficiently today than they were then. The amount of oil per unit of GDP uh, in the US has gone down by a very significant factor. So we're actually, uh, energy efficiency has paid off in terms of 
uh, one possible measure of energy independence, which is your ability to continue functioning in the face of uh, very much higher world prices. Um, there's a question here which I'll direct first to Dave, but other people can certainly try and answer it too. Uh, to what extent can the expertise gained in sparsely populated Wyoming be applied to more densely populated areas such as the East Coast? That's a nice local question for you, Dave. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, first of all, since I hate to have people come to Wyoming tell me what to do, I want to be careful that I, that I don't do that to you. It's a very um, political comment. That's right. I, I tell you what I do believe, though, is that um, the fundamental principle of um, regulation works um, both in urban and non-urban areas. You have, to, you have to figure out, though, some slight changes in the sense that um, you may have to have setbacks from houses that are different. I mean, we don't have to worry a lot about that. Uh, you may need, uh, but remember, you need to talk about the setback for the well location, not the downhole location, right? Uh, they're very different. And so um, there are some modifications you should, you should make, but I think the principles are applicable. That is, regulation needs to be done by the people who are actually competent to do it uh, so that they're able to uh, make it work that needs to be done as, as close to a local level as you can. Uh, counties don't do it in Wyoming. I mean, ours is a, a, uh, a state in which the mineral estate is the dominant estate, so counties really don't have much authority. Um, but um, you need to make sure that whoever does it understands the local geological conditions. They vary even within Wyoming, I and mean, they certainly vary between what goes on in Wyoming and what is in the Marcellus or in the Utica. Uh, the other thing is, is I think the, the other principle is to make sure that you recognize that your regulations need to take advantage of what incentivizes the company. The company does not want to waste money on a frack that gets away from it. Right? So the good operators are going to work with you. And then make it really high in terms of barriers for the bad operators. High bonds that they may or may not be able to get. Uh, make sure that you've got strict standards that they have to meet and if they fail to meet them they don't get their next permit. Uh, and, you know, it is not, those principles work whether it's urban or rural. I think you have a different public relations problem in, in urban areas. Uh, and that requires that the public officials spend much more time actually talking to, pe to people about how the regulatory scheme meets its obligation to protect the citizen and the interests of the citizen. Thanks. But other than that, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on that quickly? Sure, yeah, okay. So here's a question which I think was inspired by you, in fact, Travis. Um, it's addressed to everybody. How high can the price of natural gas go before natural gas loses its economic appeal? Um, it, so it'll depend a lot uh, which demand, mar or demand sector you're thinking about. Um, we were talking last night. Probably, I, this is where I think that sometimes if you understand how the market's going to function, it makes policy somewhat easier. So I, I'd love to hear Jason's thoughts on the debate around um, LNG export permitting, which has obviously been a huge deal. But I actually, if I had a, if I had, if I had a, uh, if I were king for a day, good Lord, no. Um, the, um, my, uh, m my, my strategy would be just to issue as many LNG permits as, uh, export permits as, as anybody wants, right? You want one? Would you like one? Um, the, from Wyoming. Um, the, um, my, um, uh, the, my belief is, is that at about six bucks, uh, which I think is the bottom end of the, of the forward uh, price curve over any meaningful period of time, and certainly over the life of an LNG train or terminal, um, which is substantially longer, multi-decadal uh, time horizon, I just don't think anybody's convinced that the prices are going to stay low enough to matter. Now, I, don't, I think some of those terminals will still get built, but I think that, uh, that they'll get built as, an, as, a, as a piece of negotiating leverage for people that want to break the indexing contracts um, on Qatari uh, gas and get down to a more cost-based um, uh, pricing model for imports into, say, uh, Japan or China or, or, or Europe. So I, I think that, that, but I don't think we'll be exporting much because I think at six bucks that market kind of dries up because when you think about all the losses and then the transport costs and all the other things, plus you think about the breaking of the index on the other side and prices coming down, arbitrage happens and it ju we just don't produce the cheapest gas for that type of, uh, of, of demand market. I think when you get into to, to, um, you know, thermal 
uh, sorry, uh, uh, thermal um, electric power generation, so displacing of, of, of coal, either <coughs> current coal or taking a lion's share of things going forward, I actually think that you've got a ways to go. You know, eight, ten dollars is probably reasonable and cheaper than coal, particularly when you start thinking about just the marginal new dispatchable large-scale power plant requirements. Um, I think when you get it into things like heating in the winter, it gets kind of inelastic, right? I mean, we'll pay whatever the price is. They send me the bill, I pay the bill. Um, the, um, and so I think that there are markets there that will persist. So I, but I think you'll see meaningful amounts of demand dropping off, um, certainly from, from forecasts <coughs> and expectations as you get into the 6 to $8 range. But that's, that's just my forecast. Jason, you want to? Yeah, I'll just uh, make three points. On the export question, um, I, I th all the analyses I know of that are out there, except for the one funded by Dow Chemical, reach the same conclusion that uh, Travis does, um, which is that uh, – there is uh, not a huge amount of natural gas exports just will not be uh, economic. The study that the Department of Energy commissioned as part of their permitting process from NERA Consulting in their reference case actually found no exports would happen. They actually had to drive exports into the model by assuming some supply shock or some demand shock. Um, so, uh, so all the analyses I know of sort of suggest we'll see some, but not a huge amount of uh, natural gas uh, exports. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the supply curve, but I think there's reason to believe that the supply curve for natural gas is pretty flat in the four. There's variance. There's a lot of heterogeneity, but in the four, five, six dollar uh, range, there's a lot of natural gas uh, in the U.S. that can be economically produced and. Industry has every incentive to drive those costs down and to get more efficient and to figure out ways to, to bring those costs down. And I suspect that that has happened and I suspect that will continue. Um, and then the last point I would make just in terms of, you know, we've talked about coal to gas substitution and the ability for low natural gas prices to drive out coal. We saw a lot of that last year. It's actually turned around a little bit this year because because uh, natural gas prices have come back up. Cheap natural gas doesn't solve our climate problem, right? It's not, it's not the way you drive coal out of the U.S. market. Um, it can help lower the cost of meeting climate targets. And so we need policy to solve climate change. But a lot, an abundance of relatively low-cost natural gas helps lower the cost of achieving those climate policies. Uh, and that's an important point. You know, the International Energy Agency a few days ago put out a report at the Clean Energy Ministerial that found that the carbon intensity of the average unit of energy after $2 trillion of spending on clean energy over the last 20 years has changed not at all. Uh, we've seen massive, we've seen very large increases in renewable uh, deployment in uh, the OECD countries, and that's been more than offset by the dramatic increase in coal use uh, in China and India uh, and other places. And so I think we need to get serious about, in a world of an abundance of relatively low-cost fossil fuels, globally, which is what climate change is, how we're going to address uh, the climate problem. And I think that low price natural gas and figuring out ways through policy and increased production to drive natural gas into the power sector helps. And we're going to need carbon capture and storage technology as well, because there's too much cheap coal to think it's going to stay in the ground. Great. So we've got time for one more question. And uh, there's an awful lot of questions left here, but I picked this one, which I think is interesting and intriguing. Uh, I think this was directed primarily to Dave, but so I'll give Dave the first crack at it, but uh, everybody can have a go on it too, because it's, real, it's going to be a real fun question. Uh, focusing on prolific oil and gas fields like the Marcellus Shale, how credible is the argument that taxing resources extracted discourages the development of, of these resources? What level do you feel is an appropriate tax rate? Oh. So you guys taxed in Wyoming, so you've got to answer oh, yeah. that question first. Um, you know, the time period in Wyoming went through that argument was a post Arab oil embargo, which is the sort of the last kind of big energy boom. And uh, all of the companies, and at that time I worked for a guy who was governor, and the big pitch was if you tax us, we're going to leave. Uh, they never left. Um, and uh, uh, the, the other thing was that if you regulate us in terms of SO2, we're going to leave. I mean, they're always, they always have their bags packed, but they, <laughs> but they, but they never get in the car. Um, and, and what I would tell you, though, is that, is that what we did do is we tried to keep those rates understanding, back to my point about understand businesses' perspective. What can they absorb? You know, uh, gas probably, natural gas is 6% severance, 6% ad valorem. Um, it's, uh, it's about 12%, and then you got royalties on top of that, and depending on how it's distributed. So it is not an unmanageable number. They will tell you it is. 
I mean, um, I mean, I, I can tell you that this particular governor I worked for, they came in and, and they said, well, we're going to, you know, if you do this, uh, uh, this was on an uh, environmental matter, if you do this, we're going to leave. And his response, which I think is the right response, is don't let the door hit you in the backside. Um, because the truth is... Is that exactly what he said? No, but <laughs> it, it's a, it's a G-rated version. <laughs> but I guess my point is don't overtax. Because for, for one thing, um, it, it gives the public the wrong sense about uh, that public goods are free, and they're not. You know, you're offloading, you're exporting. Uh, but the other thing is that uh, these industries, they do have a point at which they, uh, uh, they can't survive. So, but I will tell you, there are lots of people who can give you those numbers, and if you have legitimate discussions with some of the industry guys, they're pretty honest about it. The trade associations aren't, I mean, those guys get paid to run around and, and, you know, beat their breasts. And I represent a bunch of oil and gas guys now, and they pay lawyers to run around and say, oh, my God, the world will end. And I just tell them I can't say that because I didn't believe that when I was governor. I don't believe it now. But you will find that there is a point, an inflection point, where if you tax it too much, you can do it. But when you calculate your taxes, remember to take into account the environmental costs that you're imposing if you impose any additional ones. And you may have to do that in some of the urban areas in terms of uh, spacing, offsets, and some other things. But it's, it's not a, you know, I uh, know there's a fellow here from Montana State. One of the things we loved about it was Montana taxed them until they didn't stay there. So they came to Wyoming. And, uh, and we did pretty well. But, you, but remember, when they say they're leaving, uh, there, is a, there is a point at which you can force them out. But um, if they're honest with you, there's a lot of uh, give in there. Right. But you got it. But the, the other key is make it stable, right? Make it so that they know what it is, so that it is predictable, so that if they're going to plan a 20-year field, they know what the tax rate's going to be. Uh, they can factor in just about anything if it's stable and they know what the rules are. If they don't know what the rules are, right? Saying that. The other thing is on taxes, think about the private royalty holders, right? The other transfer of wealth that occurs in, in mineral development is the private royalty holder, right? And one of the ways you protect the private royalty holder is we passed a law that said if the company fails to pay the private royalty holder, um, he gets the, the honor of paying an 18% per annum penalty. Right? That, uh, why was that passed? Because the Wyoming legislature is full of landmen, oilmen, and agriculturalists. And who owns the, the minerals? Landmen, oilmen, and agriculturalists. And so, uh, and that is one of the ways that the system will police itself. Because then lawyers, and I did this when I was in private practice, lawyers then organize the, the uh, uh, royalty owners, and you, d you go to a class action. And when the penalty is 18%, the industry gets religion. So don't just think about the state side of the revenue, the public side. Think about the private side. And what can you do to make sure they actually get the rewards that they anticipate? Uh, you can't beat on that practical experience. So. Right. Jason. Okay, so well, we're actually out of time at this point. Um, so let me thank the panelists very much indeed. Thank you.